Albert Speer, Hitler's scheming architect. He built the Führer's invincible image and sacrificed thousands to make his weapons of war. And when it was all over, I swear by God, he orchestrated one of the biggest cover-ups in history. It's an interesting story to see how he got away with it and why people for many decades were prepared and even keen to believe what he said. Most people from my generation don't understand how over 70 years ago, a small group of Nazis could start a war that killed 60 million people. I want to find out, and to help me, I'm going to use playing cards. Today, they're used by both the military and law enforcement to help identify their targets. But nobody has ever put together a pack of cards for the most notorious group of killers in history. Working with experts, I want to know where each of these Nazis rank in the hierarchy of evil. My name is James Ellis. This is Hitler's Most Wanted. Speer is one of those Nazis that people, especially of my generation, don't really know about. But he played such an integral role in the regime. Yet, when it came to the end of the war, he managed to escape the noose. How did he manage to not get hung for his crimes? He managed to convince those judges at Nuremberg, and he managed to convince the world at large that actually he was the gentleman Nazi. He did a few nasty, beastly things, but really he wasn't really one of the bad guys. Speer wanted the world to believe that he was a technocrat, that he was swept along by the currents of history, that he wanted to do his job, be an architect, and didn't know about the atrocities that were going on. In order to have a life pre-1945 and after 1945, it takes a certain amount of conviction, first of all, for that lie, and it also takes some resolve um, in order to live with it for that length of time. So how do we separate what he did before the end of the war and the story that he told about what he did after the end of the war? So you have to base your understanding of Speer on his concrete actions, not on the stories he told. The actions tell a very different story. I want to understand Albert Speer's true role in Hitler's Third Reich. For that, I'm heading to Germany. I'm starting in the city that's synonymous with both the rise and fall of the Nazis, Nuremberg. Where we are right now, this is known as the, the VIP rostrum. I'm here with historian Kevin Hoskins at the site of one of Speer's earliest architectural projects the Nazi party rally ground, to find out how he became a Nazi and rose through the ranks. The structure in the center, that's known as the Golden Hall. And on top of there was that big golden swastika that we've all seen blown up by the Americans a million times. Oh, so it was on the top of that building? The Americans blew that up on the 22nd of April, 1945. Wow. The swastika's destruction was a symbolic act of retribution. to let the world know that the Allies had finally defeated the Nazis. For almost 10 years, this was the beating heart of Germany's totalitarian regime, where the masses came to worship at the feet of Adolf Hitler. This grand monument to fascism was the brainchild of one man. But who exactly was Albert Speer? And how did he come to design it? Speer came from an upper-middle-class family, a family of architects. And so Speer pursued architectural studies in the family tradition. Speer attended a speech by Hitler in 1930, and he was quite taken with Hitler, and he began to believe that Hitler could be a savior of the German people. Uh, he joined the party in 1931. The way he got his start is he redesigned the Nazi party headquarters in Berlin. Speer's work caught the eye of Hitler's notorious minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels. After the Nazis came to power in 33, Goebbels had Speer redesign the propaganda ministry. By this time, he's starting to get noticed by Hitler. He was given the commission to design the Nazi party rally grounds, and that's where he really comes to Hitler's attention and really impresses him. Speer's task was to create a structure that would transform Hitler the politician 
into Hitler the God. This particular structure, the VIP uh, rostrum, was actually copied from another great empire, namely the Greek Empire. Right, I was going to say, it has like an ancient civilization feel to it. Well, Hitler and Albert Speer, they like neoclassical architecture, so copying other great empires kind of fit in with that. Now, an interesting little side story, the original plan for Hitler's entry here on the VIP rostrum was he was going to enter the back side of the Golden Hall, come through these doors, walk down these stairs to the, the rostrum there, but Hitler never did that. And why? why? Hitler never came in the back door anywhere. The way Hitler made his entry is he came right down the front in his convertible Mercedes, giving yep. everybody his famous salute, and walked yep. up the front. That's the way the Fuhrer made his entry. Standing up here, you just get a feel for the scale of this thing. It's huge. I mean, you can see a football pitch here. You could probably fit about 12 of them in this space. You could fit 85,000 spectators around the field there on three sides, plus 15,000 more here on the VIP rostrum. And they had space for up to 250,000 participants in the field. So this thing could hold, what, over 300,000? Correct. That's an extraordinary amount of people. That's over six times the capacity of New York's Yankee Stadium. You can imagine how thundering it must have sounded with people all shouting in unison, Heil, Heil. The noise must have been just deafening. Hitler was viewed as sort of as this, this almost godlike savior who was going to bring Germany into the forefront, was going to create uh, the master race. And what Speer provided was a kind of massive cathedral to Nazism. You know, your eye is drawn to one man alone. That, of course, would have been Adolf Hitler. So Hitler would have come along here. Correct. Mounted these steps. Yes. And then he would have stood, what, right here? Right, right here in the center. And delivered his speeches to the masses from this spot. Exactly. Hey, man. And you can imagine standing here, everybody saying, Heil. Those people screaming your name out. Yeah, you'd feel like God standing up here. It is a monumentally huge stage for a monumentally huge ego, and it was Speer who created it. In 1934, Hitler appointed Speer the Reich's chief architect, and the two became good friends. They certainly formed close relationship, and it may be that Hitler, as somebody who had had artistic ambitions and hadn't been able to realize them, saw in Speer somebody who was having the kind of career that he could have had, not as an artist, but as an architect. Speer was given the opportunity to fulfill his wildest professional ambitions, and there were other benefits to being the Fuhrer's architect. Speer takes an enormous amount of personal wealth from all these projects that he's mandated to do by the Fuhrer. Uh, you know, he is doing land deals, you know, and real estate deals on the back of all these state-sponsored projects. So he, he's feathering his own nest. Speer's rapid rise through the Nazi ranks was unprecedented among Hitler's followers. Throughout the late 1930s, he lived a life of privilege and luxury, never far from the Fuhrer's side. During the war, Hitler rewarded Speer's loyalty by appointing him Minister of Armaments, entrusting him with the vital task of keeping the German war machine rolling. Albert Speer reached heights in the Reich that few Nazis could boast. Given what Speer's monument to Megalomania now represents, you have to question its continued existence. Why not tear it down? There's two camps. Okay, there's, there's one camp that says, you know, let it, let it, you know, deteriorate into dust, let's tear it down, let's use it for something else. And then you have the other camp that says, we have to maintain it to make sure that the things that happened here under National Socialism don't happen again. There's actually graffiti on the Golden Hall here that says, Nie wieder Krieg, which means never again war. 
But just as the city of Nuremberg played host to Speer's rise, it was also the site of both his and the Nazi party's fall. Those top four windows on the front of the building here, that's where uh, the Nuremberg trials took place. All right, so they happened right there. Correct. It's in this building that the true character of Hitler's best friend emerged. I swear by God that I will speak the pure truth. I'm in Nuremberg with historian Kevin Hoskins on a mission to find out where Nazi architect Albert Speer ranks in Hitler's hierarchy of evil. This is the, the portion of the complex here known as the Justice Palace. In room 600, those top four windows on the front of the building here, that's where uh, the Nuremberg trials took place. All right, so they happened right there. Correct. On November 20th, 1945, a little over six months after Germany surrendered, 22 of the Fuhrer's highest-ranking accomplices were put on trial, including Albert Speer. If found guilty, most of the defendants faced death by hanging. One by one, they pled innocent. Next, came Hitler's armaments minister. Albert Speer. Speer faced four charges relating to his actions during wartime, which many believed helped prolong the deadliest conflict in modern history. Speer, you know, managed to increase munitions production. In doing so, he increased Germany's capacity to fight, and in doing so, lengthened the war. In his plea, Speer towed the line with his other defendants. Speer is indicted under all four counts. But when it came to his defense, he shocked everyone in the court. I swear by God that I will speak the pure truth. Es wäre ihm nahezu gelungen, mittels seines technischen Vorsprungs Europa zu unterwerfen. He railed against Hitler for his despotic actions and warned the world about leaving future fascists unchecked. Je technischer die Welt wird, umso größer ist diese Gefahr. Speer even went on to do something none of his co-accused were willing to. Speer gets this reputation from these trials as the Nazi who said sorry. Can you tell me about that? Well, that comes from a couple of things. One, he, he was the only guy in the, in the first trial that actually showed any kind of remorse. He also presented himself as largely ignorant of the Holocaust and of the extent of the persecution and attempted extermination of Jews. I think what he was primarily trying to do there was distance himself from the other defendants. Because at this point, it was, it was like rats on a sinking ship. It was every man for himself. And he figured that his best bet for uh, getting through this was to cooperate. What that did was, is it gave the prosecution an idea. You know, this guy, he's breaking away from the pack, so maybe we can use him as a wedge against the other guys. So that's what happened. Um Speer presented evidence against the Reich and even his fellow defendants. In the dock, they were disgusted by his actions. Speer cooperated with the prosecution, did a little snitching, uh, also was credited with providing the court with the most realistic view of Nazi Germany. His extraordinary testimony climaxed with a bombshell. Speer told the court that as the Allies closed in on Berlin, he concocted a plan to assassinate Hitler to end the conflict and save the German people from any further death and destruction. Speer famously goes to the Führer bunker in the very dying days of the war and goes and has his last somewhat tortured meeting with Hitler. Speer will later claim that he was minded to introduce poison gas into the Führer bunker in order to kill everybody. But on further questioning, Speer could only offer a string of flimsy excuses to explain why his plan failed. Speer spun fables. We know that this is a lie. Much of what Speer was saying was absolute nonsense. It was all part of a desperate attempt to save his own neck. The tribunal has considered the whole of this evidence with great care. On October 1st, 1946, the verdicts were announced. The tribunal finds that Speer is not guilty on counts one and two, but is guilty on counts three 
and four. Speer was convicted of capital crimes, but when the judges handed down their sentence, he found his cooperation had paid off. Instead of getting the noose like I personally believe he deserved, all he got was 20 years in Spandau. Albert Speer was going to prison. His acceptance of a collective responsibility and his willingness to serve as a star witness against some of the other leading Nazis probably saved his life. Of the 22 men on trial, only three were acquitted. 12 were sentenced to death by hanging, and seven, including Speer, were given jail time. Speer was incarcerated at Spandau Prison in West Berlin. He'd spend the next 20 years behind bars. But what's the real story behind Hitler's Minister of Armaments? To find out, I'm heading to Germany's capital, Berlin. How is Speer connected to this place? It's a camp for forced laborers. How are you going to produce as many weapons in the shortest time possible? You're going to need slaves. There must be a light around here somewhere. Yeah, there is, yeah. Oh, OK, can I switch it on? Yeah. My mission to determine where Albert Speer ranks in Hitler's hierarchy of evil has brought me to Berlin. Berlin was, of course, a huge spot uh, for production. I've come to this former work camp to meet historian Magnus Bracken to learn more about Albert Speer's actions as armaments minister during the war. So what exactly is this camp and what was its function? It's a camp for forced laborers and the function was to provide labor force for armaments production and other workforce. Uh, you, you will find then all over Germany, right? Uh, because forced labor was a very basic part of uh, keeping the war running. Slave labor was absolutely crucial to the Nazi economy, and the man who used it more than anyone else was Albert Speer. His role as armaments minister uh, is to try and produce as many weapons as possible. Well, how are you going to produce as many weapons in the shortest time possible? You're going to need slaves. There, there is no other way he has of doing it, because he sure as hell ain't going to pay them. And how is Speer connected to this place? Uh, this special camp in 1943, Italian uh, forced laborers have been working here, and these were people who actually came into the uh, realm of Speer because uh, Italy changed sides in September yes. 1943, and Speer immediately took the opportunity to get control. But for Speer, amassing slave laborers was about much more than just maximizing production. This is an important aspect of Speer in general, to gain control over forced labor, to get control of as many people as possible, to have the reflection of power that this represents. The more people he has, the more power he has within the National Socialist system. This barrack complex would have been used to house the laborers yes. here. Yeah, I think it was up to 2,700. And it's, of course, narrow, dark. If you imagine people cramped here, and constantly hungry, and 12-hour working shift. There must be a light switch in here somewhere. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Inmates here also lived with a constant fear of being hit by Allied bombers that targeted Berlin. Is this a bomb shelter? Yeah, well, it's a cellar, which was obviously used as a bomb shelter. Right. But uh, you can imagine when you are in here and there's just a few centimeters of concrete above you and then there's a barrack above this, that if a bomb hits this place, there is not much protection. And if you have a hit close by and everything falls on top of this. You've been buried alive down here. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Places like this where all over Europe where people had to work in one way or another for Speer and for uh, his huge empire uh, of, of uh, production during the war. Punishment consists of starvation. At the Nuremberg trial, the prosecution presented eyewitness accounts of the horrors laborers endured. Proper medical treatment or care for the sick are not available in the mass camps. The consequence is complete exhaustion. 
an ailing state of health, and tuberculosis. There are cases of eight-year-old delicate and undernourished children put to forced labor and perishing from such treatment. We shall show that the defendants Sauckel and Speer are principally responsible for the formulation of the policy and for its execution. Fritz Sauckel was Speer's subordinate in charge of rounding up slave laborers. When faced with the death sentence, Speer pointed the finger of blame at Saukel alone. Und Saukel ließ sich dazu den Auftrag geben, drei Millionen Arbeits, dreieinhalb Millionen Arbeitskräfte aus den besetzten Gebieten zu holen. Dabei gab Hitler schärfste Weisung über OKW an die Militärbefehlshaber, den Forderungen Saukels mit allen Mitteln nachzukommen. Waren Sie mit dieser Entscheidung einverstanden? Nein, keineswegs. They managed. At Nuremberg, he switched it is around and says, well, I was only uh, the armaments minister. I had nothing to do with forced labor people. That was Saukel. He had uh, the task by Hitler to get these people from all over uh, Europe. I, I was not connected to this. Blindsided by Speer's betrayal, Saukil desperately tried to lie his way out of a guilty verdict. In meinem eigenen Aufgabengebiet immer alles daran gesetzt. Ausschreitungen, Willkür, Roheit jeder Art zu verhindern. Gott schütze ein über alles geliebte Volk. But it didn't work. Okay. Saukil is indicted on all four counts. On counts one and two, he is guilty. Based on Speer's testimony, Fritz Saukel was convicted of crimes against humanity and hanged. It's an interesting story to see how he got away with it and why he got away with it and why people for many decades were uh, prepared and even keen to believe what he said. Albert Speer convinced the judges at Nuremberg that he was just a civil servant who had no direct hand in Nazi atrocities. All right, so what have you got here? In reality, the trial never brought to light the true nature of his commitment to the regime. Das ist also eine groß angelegte Planung für die Umgestaltung Berlins. So if the Nazis had won the war, this would have been the capital of the world. Or the vile lengths he would go to achieve his aims. More than 55,000 Jews were victims of mass deportations out of Berlin. I'm in Berlin on a mission to find out where Nazi architect Albert Speer sits in Hitler's hierarchy of evil. At the Nuremberg trials, Speer portrayed himself as a reluctant participant in Hitler's dream of worldwide domination. But there are those who know otherwise. Ja, ich äh, wollte hier mal ein sehr ungewöhnliches und auffälliges Bauwerk zeigen hier. You can't really see it through the trees here. Hartmut Graz is a historian and an expert on the architectural history of Berlin. So what exactly is this structure? Ein Vollbetonzylinder, der wiegt also 16.000 Tonnen, der also hier einfach ähm, hingestellt wurde, gebaut wurde, um den Druck des Erdbodens zu testen für ein großes Bauwerk, nämlich für den sogenannten Triumphbogen. In June 1940, the German army seized Paris. Hitler made a special one-day trip to the French capital to see its architectural wonders. Among the select group with him that day was Albert Speer. The two were looking for ideas for the Führer's plan to remake Berlin into the ultimate Nazi capital. I mean, Hitler was obsessed with legacy. You know, Hitler knew that he was going to die like any other uh, person on this planet, but what he wanted to leave behind was something that was almost indelible, or at least going to last a thousand years. What lasts a long time? Big buildings last a long time. And you don't get bigger buildings than what Hitler and Speer designed for their new world capital, Germania. They saw themselves as, as the two men alone had a vision for what the Third Reich was going to look like in the next century and the century beyond that. 
Das ist also eine groß angelegte Planung für die Umgestaltung Berlins. Die Idee, der Traum, den hat Hitler in den 20er Jahren ähm, skizziert, zum Beispiel eine große Halle und einen Triumphbogen. In Paris, Hitler und Speer drive past the city's famed Arc de Triomphe and take notes. Es ist groß, es ist gigantisch, es soll Menschen einschüchtern. Germania's planned arch would be so heavy, Speer was worried it would actually sink into the ground. But even the arch was dwarfed by their plans for the domed Volkshalle. When you're looking at the grand hall he designed for Germania, you know, it was so big that all the breath would have created clouds in it and it would have actually rained inside. The thing about Speer's thinking architecturally is that actually it doesn't really work on a human scale. And it shows that ultimately Speer didn't really have an appreciation of humanity. I think a common characteristic of the Nazi mindset at the time was that they were, in fact, the superior race. There's this collective narcissism. There's this collective understanding that they were worthy of uh, adulation. I think that Speer's buildings demonstrate this. Hitler hat gesagt, die große Halle, ja, da sollte ursprünglich oben der Adler sein, der das Hakenkreuz in den Klauen hat. Und er hat die Planung umgeändert. Er hat gesagt, der Adler soll die Weltkugel in, der, in den Klauen haben. Die sagen eigentlich damit, hier ist der Mittelpunkt der Welt. Es ist also eine scheingebaute Rassismus eigentlich. Yes. Speer's huge monuments to Hitler would have stood along the so-called Avenue of Splendors, dwarfing everything around them. So you'd arrived, you'd see these ginormous ja, buildings, and then right at the dieser, end you'd see dieser, the Volkshalle. Ja das damals das größte Gebäude der Welt werden sollte. And what's this building here in red? Das ist der Reichstag. So that's the Reichstag that's standing now. Ja. So that just gives you an idea. That's what they wanted to build. How much bigger that is than the ja, Reichstag. Ja. That's also, extraordinary. Ja. Das ist eine reine Kulisse, nur Kulisse eigentlich für die große Inszenierung des Nationalsozialismus. In 1937, three years before their Paris tour, Hitler had appointed Speer Berlin's chief building inspector to prepare the city for its mighty transformation. Speer's master plan meant tens of thousands of Berlin households would have to be demolished to make way for construction. That would have deadly consequences. So we're on the, uh, the bank of the Spree right now, and on the other side is the Reichstag. Yes. And so what... I've come to meet historian Susanna Willems to find out more. I wanted to take you to these Stolpersteine the commemoration for 10 people who used to live in one flat which was vacated in early 1941. So he'd earmarked this area and other parts of the city to be demolished for the world capital Germania yes. uh, building to rehouse the people that were being evicted from this area. They were evicting Jews and rehousing these people here. He convinced people in the Ministry for Economy that taking over the big flats of Jews would save a lot of money to the state. So he proposed it as a measure of saving public funds. Really, really horrifying. But Berlin's Jews weren't simply being evicted. The commemoration is to Willy and Rosalie Hirsch, the tenants of one flat in the building. Sobibor, the name at the bottom of these plaques, was an extermination camp in Nazi-occupied Poland. Between 1942 and 1943, the Nazis sent an estimated 250,000 Jews there to be killed in gas chambers. And do we know how many Jews were victim of Speer's building plans? At least 45,000. Wow. If, if Speer had slowed down and let aside his interest as a general bo uh, building inspector, um, many of the Berlin Jews would have survived. At Nuremberg, Speer claimed to know little of the concentration camps and what took place in them. This document I discovered among the papers kept in Moscow in the special archives. In her own investigation, Susanna traveled to Moscow where she gained access to captured Nazi documents that shed new light on Speer and the Holocaust. It's the record of a meeting he attended in 1941. So you have here Vice Minister Professor Speer sitting with SS Obergruppenführer Pohl 
and then personnel of Speer and the SS. Right, okay. And one topic is uh, enlargement of the uh, camp of barracks in Auschwitz following the deportations to the east. Auschwitz in southern Poland was the biggest and most notorious of all the Nazi camps. More than a million people were sent to their deaths there between 1940 and 1945. The result of this conversation was Ice Minister Professor Speer mm -hmm. has uh, allowed it and he has assigned 13.7 million Reichsmark. You find here four Leichenhallen gas chambers. So this is, a, this is an order for four gas chambers for yes. Auschwitz. Yes. And this is from the money that Speer is um, allowing them to use. Yeah. So this document shows that Speer not only knew about Auschwitz, but he's involved in its actual physical expansion. Yes. Wow. Uh, so he not only knew about the Holocaust, but he was directly involved in the extermination of Jews. Yeah, the program was actually called Special Program Professor Speer. Yes. Oh my God. None of this evidence was submitted at Nuremberg. Once again, Speer's carefully constructed lies covered up his crimes. But Speer's story still contains one final secret that lies buried in a place that can only be described as hell. You only have to look at Mittelbaudora to realize quite how evil Albert Speer really was. I'm on a mission to find out where Albert Speer ranks in Hitler's hierarchy of evil. The tribunal finds that Speer is not guilty on counts one and two Hitler's architect managed to convince the Nuremberg court that he was innocent of crimes against humanity. Speer was a brilliant liar, and he was also a brilliant actor. You know, he played this role of the kind of apologetic, gentlemanly, quote-unquote, good Nazi, you know, uh, to the absolute maximum, and it worked. I'm on my way to a place that will prove, beyond a shadow of a doubt, just how guilty he was. This is Mittelbaudora concentration camp in central Germany. It doesn't look very imposing at first glance until you discover that most of the camp is underground. It's incredibly cold and it's damp. It's got a musty smell about it. It's here that Albert Speer committed atrocities that almost defy imagination. By 1943, the Allies were launching regular bombing raids on German factories making weapons and ammunition. To keep the Nazi war machine running at full steam, Speer took production underground. Wow, look at the size of this place. It's huge. In all, 60,000 inmates were forced to work down here in conditions that were utterly inhumane. People were basically forced to be, you know, troglodytes living underground for months of the time. This camp also stands out as it was a key production facility for one of the most powerful weapons of the entire war. This is an engine from a, a V2 rocket, and that's what they were assembling down here in these tunnels. The V2 rocket was the world's first long-range ballistic missile. It had a guidance system that enabled it to hit targets up to 200 miles away. Hitler unleashed the V2 on the cities of Western Europe and Britain in September 1944, causing devastating damage and mass civilian casualties. It was the Fuhrer's last desperate attempt to prolong the war and remain in power. But to make that happen, he needed a steady supply of V2s to hurl at them. Look at this. Parts of rockets. So this is clearly chamber 44. One of the chambers where the laborers were forced to build armaments. 
At one point, a thousand laborers were forced to live in this small chamber. Slaves worked and slept down here for months on end, using barrels for a latrine. Speer visited Mittelbaudor personally, so any denial on Speer's part of knowing the extent of the conditions and the suffering there is a complete lie. Laborers were regularly worked to death, building a weapon that in reality didn't pay off. The big irony about the V2 rocket is that more people were killed making that rocket than were killed by that rocket. You only have to look at the grim statistics of Middle Baldora to realize what a horrific place it was. Between 43 and 45, 60,000 people were sent there and only 20,000 got out alive. That's 40,000 deaths right on Albert Speer's doorstep. Ooh. And these look like stretchers used to bring the dead bodies of the inmates up here. Oof. So these are the ovens. Oh, I've shed. What's the matter? I feel physically sick being so close to these ovens, knowing what they were made for, specifically for burning the bodies of inmates who died here. Looks like there's artwork on these walls, flowers. It's so strange to see artwork on the walls of a crematorium. Ultimately, Speer never shared the fate of the thousands who died behind the camp walls. He was released from Spandau prison on October 1st, 1966, to adoring crowds and an enthusiastic press. What I find extraordinary is that Albert Speer emerges from Spandau after 20 years imprisonment, and he becomes the kind of darling of the talk show circuit. And he's even interviewed by Playboy magazine. Speer was now widely known as having been Hitler's closest confidant. This made him a hot commodity in a world still fascinated with the man who dragged it to the brink of total destruction. The newly freed Speer was only too happy to give the people what they wanted, with an extra helping of wit and charm. The fact that before 1945 he seems to be one person and after 1945 he portrays himself as a completely different person suggests a skillfulness um, in being able to manage multiple impressions, which is not something that everybody can necessarily do. Speer died in 1981 at age 76. To many, he remained the Nazi who saw the light, a lone noble figure among some of history's worst criminals. He sold the world a massive lie that he was essentially a decent man caught up in a very, very kind of compromising position. No, he willingly became friends you know, with the most evil man of the 20th century. He was a key component of the Nazi regime I think he was a thoroughly detestable and evil man. Now it's time for me to find out where that man ranks in Hitler's hierarchy of evil. And there's a question about whether the person who does it because he's truly devoted to the cause or the person that does it because of self-benefit is worse. Which one is truly worse? My mission to Germany has given me new insight into Albert Speer's involvement in both the Nazi war effort and the Holocaust. It's also exposed the many lies he told to escape the death penalty and whitewash his legacy. Now it's time for us to decide where he should sit in the hierarchy of evil. Using our unique system of playing cards, I want to know where Speer ranks in Hitler's Most Wanted. One of the places I visited was the Nuremberg Rally Grounds, which Speer obviously designed. How important a moment was that for Speer? It's hugely important. The scale and the scope of those rally grounds are also reflected in Speer's plans to remake Berlin into the world capital of Germania. You see these plans for grandiose, monstrous buildings, and that shows this shared obsession that Speer and Hitler had of Germany as a power that would dominate the world. His grandiose plans for developing Berlin lead to hundreds, thousands of Jews being thrown out of the German capital. Where do they end up? Being killed in concentration camps. 
The line between a Jew being murdered and Speer is a direct one. In his memoirs, Speer denied being an anti-Semite and a true believer in Nazi ideals. But even if this was true, would it absolve him of his role in the Reich's crimes against humanity? Of all the places I visited, the place that had the biggest impact on me was the Mittelwerk tunnels, where thousands of slave laborers were forced to build weapons for the Nazi war machine. When you went to those tunnels, you saw what Speer didn't want you to see. Speer wanted the world to believe that he was a technocrat, that he was swept along by the currents of history, that he wanted to do his job, be an architect, and didn't have political impulses, didn't have political convictions, and didn't know about the atrocities that were going on. In his roles as building inspector and armaments minister, Albert Speer caused the deaths of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people. Yet his carefully conceived lies convinced his accusers that he was an innocent man. Speer would love to be remembered. He'd love to be remembered as the Nazi who was welcome at salons, the Nazi who didn't know what was going on, the cultured and cultivated Nazi. We have to dispense with all of that. Uh, it sounds as though everything after 1945 is, is, is a falsehood, is a lie. Well, and that deflection of responsibility is psychologically important uh, to, to be able to cope with the atrocities that, that one commits. I think that actually uh, Speer's lying and this presentation of, of seeming innocence after the war also helps Germany and a lot of Germans come to terms with what took place in Germany. It makes them feel, well, you know, if Speer is innocent, then the average German could also feel innocent. We think of Joseph Goebbels, propaganda minister, as the greatest liar the world's ever known. He wasn't. Albert Speer was. He was one of the very worst guys. And the fact that his deputy got hanged at Nuremberg and he didn't shows you quite what he got away with. So now I'd like to come to a conclusion as to where we think he ranks in the Nazi hierarchy of evil. Guy. Well, I'm putting him really high because it really annoys me that Speer has got away with it for all these decades. Um, I'm going to give him a six. Anthony? If you're talking about a militaristic regime and wars of aggression, the armaments minister has to rank high. Add to that his role in the Holocaust, and he's a six. I'm surprised, truthfully. I uh, instinctively, uh, from what I know and from the psychology of it, I would have ranked him uh, lower, but, um, but I'll defer to the historians on this one. I completely agree with you guys. I think that the myth that he created after the war has gone on for far too long, and he is definitely six, it makes him the King of Hearts. Albert Speer's deception is one of the most outrageous injustices to come out of World War II. For that, and the monstrous crimes he committed in the name of the Nazi regime, he ranks six in Hitler's hierarchy of evil.